morning and welcome to uh, worship today. Um, summer's back, I guess, isn't it? So we're going to keep the fans moving here, keep the air moving, and, and then the bulletin kind of helps on that too, so we'll go right ahead on that. So uh, just a few uh, things to uh, call to your attention. Um, our, our chosen video series is continuing in the lounge at 9 o'clock, and Ed is leading that, so uh, thank you for doing that. Um, uh, this is the third uh, video in that series. Of the fir- I think it's the first uh, um, season of that, of the, uh, of that series uh, on the life of Jesus, so uh, those have been interesting and some good discussion along with that. Also, uh, beginning this morning at 9 o'clock in the dining room, I'm um, beginning um, a class uh, uh, called Roots of Our Faith. It's uh, geared toward uh, those who are um, uh, wanting to become members of Grace, but also anyone that wants just to brush up on some of the basics with regard to the biblical story and uh, our life together as Lutherans. Um, five sessions here starting uh, this morning uh, downstairs in the dining room. And then one other thing is that I want to remind you about is the final Trinity Kingsway service is today at 1130 um, out on the site. Um, the bishop will be there. Pastor Paul's little, little one is going to be baptized by the bishop. So uh, that'll be a big uh, Sunday for them. And of course, we are invited to uh, join them for that at 1130. Okay, I think that's all we have by way of announcement. We'll begin with confession and forgiveness and let us stand. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love endures forever. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Merciful God, We confess that we have not followed your path, but have chosen our own way. Instead of putting others before ourselves, we long to take the best seats at the table. When met by those in need, we have too often passed by on the other side. Set us again on the path of life. Save us from ourselves and free us to love our neighbors. Amen. Hear the good news. God does not deal with us according to our sins, but delights in granting pardon and mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are free to love as God loves. Amen. We sing the hymn.
Christ, who was raised from the dead to bring everlasting hope, be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. Sovereign God, ruler of all hearts, you call us to obey you, and you favor us with true freedom. Keep us faithful to the ways of your Son, that leaving behind all that hinders us, we may steadfastly follow your paths. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. The first reading is from 1 Kings, the 19th chapter, verses 15 and 16, continuing with verses 19 through 21. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel as king over Ammon. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimsha, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha son of Shaphat, of abel as prophet in your place. So he set out from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, who was plowing. There were twelve yoke of oxen ahead of him, and he was with the twelve. Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle over him. He left the oxen, ran after Elijah, and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. Then Elijah said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? He returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. Using the equipment from the oxen, he boiled their flesh and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out and followed Elijah and became his servant. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Galatians, the fifth chapter starting with verse 1, continuing with verse 13 through 25. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, 
and what the spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornification, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I am warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. I'd like to invite the children forward for the children's message. Today I have this really big word on this paper. Can anybody read this? Compassion. So in a, um, in a couple weeks, in two weeks, we are going to have VBS, and our theme is compassion. Does anybody know what compassion, what compassion means? So compassion is when we see somebody else hurting, and we try to understand what they're feeling, and then we do what we can to help ease that hurt that they have, that pain. So in two weeks, we're going to have VBS in the evening over at St. John's from 6 to 7.30, July 11th through the 14th. And I think I will see most of you there. So, all right, today's children's message is about excuses. Do any of you have excuses? Yeah? What are some of the excuses that you might have? Cleaning my room. Oh, cleaning your room. Anybody else got those from time to time? I always have something better to do than clean. Well, so maybe you have excuses about doing your homework or your chores. Well, Jesus was asking people to follow him, but they had excuses. You see, he wanted them to give up everything, their friends, family, and jobs, and follow him. But all he got was their excuses. Somebody wanted to go bury their father, and somebody wanted to go pack their stuff, and somebody wanted to go say goodbye to all their friends. But Jesus said, the time is now, and he's still calling us today. Will you follow him? Or will you have excuses? I invite you to join me in prayer, and the congregation may follow along. Dear Jesus, when you call us, may we never offer excuses. Instead, may we be willing to give up everything and follow you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the ninth chapter. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him, because his face was set toward Jerusalem. 
When his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is the gospel of our Lord. Let us pray. Lord, give us strength for our journey, wisdom for our decisions, and love for our neighbors. We pray this in your name. Amen. Has anyone here this morning ever taken the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, otherwise known by its acronym MBTI? Anyone? Anyone familiar with that? Okay, I see at least one, maybe a couple out there have done that. The MBTI was created during the Second World War by Catherine Cook Briggs and her daughter, Isabel Briggs Myers, who were avid students of psychiatrist and psychoanalyst Carl Jung, and particularly his theory of personality types. Now, Myers and Briggs were convinced that a knowledge of personality preferences would help women who were entering the industrial workforce for the first time to identify the sort of wartime jobs that would be most comfortable and effective for them. The initial questionnaire grew into the Myers-Briggs type indicator, which was first published in 1962. So it's been around for a while. Now, if you've never heard of this before, here's a quick explanation of how it works. The MBTI assumes that people have four different kinds of preferences, and each with two choices. First, you are either an extrovert or an introvert. Extroverts find strength and are comfortable interacting with others. Introverts find strength and are more comfortable with their inner thoughts. So in the MBTI, you are either an E or an I. E, extroversion, I, introversion. The second preference indicates how you take in or perceive information from the outside world. And again, there are two preferences, sensing and intuition. Sensors trust their senses. Biblical Thomas was a sensor. He wanted to see and touch Jesus before he would believe. The other preference is intuition. These are people who are more likely to trust their gut feelings than anything they might learn from their senses. So in the MBTI, you are, an either, you are either an S for N sensing or an N for intuition. Now, intuition starts with an I, but we've already used I in that first set of preferences. Okay, so... Um, so an N means intuition, okay? Focus on the N sound there. Sensing or intuition, S or N. The third preference indicates how you come to a conclusion or judgment about what you have perceived. And again, there are two preferences. You are either a thinker or a feeler. A thinker comes to a conclusion based on logical facts. You go through a logical process whereas a feeler uses his or her 
feelings to base his or her conclusions on. In MBTI language, you are either a T for thinker or an F for feeler. Now, the fourth preference indicates whether your perceiving preference, which was the second one, the second letter, or your judging preference, the third letter, is the one that you make most obvious to those around you. So in that regard, you are either a J or a P. So with these four letters, and with two options for each letter, there can then be 16 different combinations which create 16 different types of personalities. Now I, when I have taken this survey, and I've taken it a number of times over the years, and it seems I always come out with the same, with the same um, uh, designation, I am an INFP. I'm an introvert. I use intuition to take information in information. I use feeling to come to a conclusion. And the P means my perceiving function or intuition is the one that most people see. Okay, uh, I'll give you an example of that. Uh, if I'm asked a question, I will start running that through my, my, uh, my system, and I won't say anything because I'm still processing, and it really takes me a while to come to a conclusion, uh, really focusing on that perceptive part of me, and so I don't always answer as quickly as people would like, especially those who are more J in their, um, uh, in, in, in their preference. Now, for years and even decades, the Myers-Briggs type indicator has been embraced and used in business, education, personal development, and more recently, by churches and congregations. And the thought is, is, is that if church council members all knew each other's type, the hope has been that people in those leadership positions would better understand each other and get more done. Now, and for most people, it's interesting to discover what your type is. And you can certainly learn something about yourself and others, but the MBTI has fallen on hard times. And even though there's probably about 2 million people a year that still take this survey, it is less popular now than it has been in the past. Most organizations that have utilized it have come to the realization that all this knowledge about personality types is pretty much useless. And churches also have found that to spend a lot of time on this is a waste of time. So in the church, in a Christian congregation, your personality type really isn't important. Perhaps a bigger and better question for congregations and Christians to ask about type is this, and it is at the heart of today's gospel. Are you a Jesus type? Are you a Jesus type? As Jesus completes his ministry in the Galilee region and begins his long journey toward Jerusalem, he encounters a variety of men and women, people of all types, and he begins a process of elimination that is bound to strike us as rather severe. First, he enters a Samaritan village and discovers that there is absolutely no way that he is going to be able to develop a relationship with anyone in the town. The Samaritans refuse to receive him because he is heading towards Jerusalem. And this is the wrong city to be going to or coming from if you want to feel love for the Samaritans, since their holy place was not the temple in Jerusalem, but Mount Gerizim. That's maybe about 10 miles north of Jerusalem in today's uh, Israel or the rest West Bank. It would be like going to the Ohio State University campus and wearing a Michigan t-shirt 
or vice versa. The bottom line is that these folks are simply incompatible. Then Jesus encounters a man along the road. We could call him an idealist, or we could call him a romantic, or we could call him, in Myers-Briggs language, an ENFP, kind of like me, except more extroverted than introverted. Whatever we might want to call him, he says this to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. But it isn't long before Jesus senses that he might have the wrong idea about the life of discipleship. And so he administers this little test of expectations. Foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now we don't know exactly what this first would-be disciple is expecting, but he might be thinking that Jesus the Messiah is going to be his meal ticket. To such dreams of comfort and affluence, Jesus gives a rude wake-up call. You want a life of luxury, he seems to be asking? You're looking in the wrong place. So if we're going to approach following Jesus idealistically or romantically, perhaps then we are not Jesus type. Short time later, Jesus sees another potential disciple. This one we could call a pragmatist, one who focuses on the practical concerns of life. He is responsible, reasonable, and rational, someone who would be in Myers-Briggs language, an ESTJ. And so Jesus extends the invitation, says, follow me. But the fellow says, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Now, is this an unreasonable demand? It doesn't seem to be at first. In fact, the duty to bury the dead was taken very seriously by devout Jews, even as it is a serious thing for us today. And it was considered good form and was considered socially expected to care for one's deceased relatives. It isn't like this guy is saying, Lord, let me make this trip to Vegas first, or Lord, let me eat this nice steak dinner first. The guy is trying to be a solid citizen and a decent catch, but Jesus is not impressed. Lord, first let me go bury my father turns out to be a red flag on Jesus' Myers-Briggs survey, an answer that threatens to get the man tossed from the discipleship pool. Let the dead bury their own dead, Jesus insists. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus sounds harsh here, doesn't he? And more than a little insensitive. But what he's trying to say is this. If you want to be my type, you have to focus on life, not death. Put your energy into proclaiming the kingdom of God, not into digging holes for dead bodies. Jesus certainly knows that dead bodies need to be put in the ground, but he assumes that there are many spiritually non-dead, non-disciples that can do this particular duty. If you want to be a disciple, your focus has to be on the kingdom and nothing else. And finally, another applicant, and we could call this person a procrastinator, a very strong P on the Myers-Briggs, one who keeps looking for new data to evaluate, approaches Jesus and says, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus hits the reject button with these familiar words. No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus will not allow anyone to turn from the path that he is calling them to follow. He expects radical commitment, total intensity, complete focus. Anything less than 100% devotion simply will not allow a discipleship match to be made. As it turns out, None of these people is Jesus' type. Not the idealist, not the pragmatist, not the procrastinator. So where does that leave us? Are we willing to turn our backs on comfort and duty and family in order to follow Jesus on the path to the kingdom of God? 
If this sounds like a relationship that involves nothing but pain and suffering and sacrifice, then we might very well say, no, I don't want to get into this. This is not for me. But I don't think Jesus is trying to lure us into a dysfunctional and destructive relationship. What Jesus is offering us is a life of intense happiness, deep fulfillment, and unending love. It's just that he needs to put us through a rather serious screening to see if we're serious about this kind of relationship with him. Today's gospel teaches us that happiness will come if we are compatible with Jesus, that we are Jesus' type in several important ways. First, we need to share his determination to travel to Jerusalem. And this means traveling with him and moving with him through sacrifice to new life. It is the dying and rising that the Catechism speaks about as it describes what baptism means for daily living. It means, says Luther, that our sinful self with all its evil deeds and desires should be drowned through daily repentance and that day after day a new self should arise to live with God in righteousness and purity forever. And then Luther in the Catechism follows that with a quote from Romans chapter 6. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. If we are going to be Jesus' type, we must be willing to walk that road to Jerusalem and be willing to die to our old selves so that we can rise to new life. Next, we are asked to put our faith in Jesus rather than in any of the creature comforts of this world. We are challenged to trust Jesus to give our lives meaning and balance and security, not our bank accounts, our pension funds, hot tubs, or even our high-speed internet connections. One of the shocking discoveries of life in the 21st century is that true satisfaction doesn't come through a high standard of living and an endless array of luxury items. Many of us thought it would, but it doesn't. Instead, inner peace comes through a life that has meaning, meaning that can be found by following Jesus. Ever since it was published 20 years ago, a best-selling Christian book has been Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Life. Life with purpose. That's what people are looking for today. And if you are willing to follow Jesus for that purpose and be willing to be his disciple, then you will truly be Jesus' type. And finally, we are challenged to look ahead. Look ahead, not back. It is so tempting to look at the past and wonder why our lives turned out the way they did. So easy to second-guess ourselves and play what-if games with the choices we have made. But Jesus says that no one who looks back is fit for the kingdom of God, and he calls us to focus forward on the life that God has in store for us. Any happiness we experience is going to come from looking ahead with hope. Any fulfillment we feel is going to come from moving forward with faith. And so are you the Jesus type? After this brief visit to the Myers-Briggs type indicator, you may discover that you are an INFP or an ESTJ or an ENTP or one of the other 13 possible types. But my hope is that the most important discovery that you will make is that you will find that you are a Jesus type. And that you and Jesus were made for each other. And together, you will have a lifetime and an eternity of happiness. Amen. We sing the hymn.
At this time, I would like uh, the members of the church council that are present at this service to uh, come forward for a brief service of installation. The following persons having been elected by the congregation to positions of leadership, and those who are present here have come forward. Uh, Nelda Bauer, um, Cindy Scranton, Jerry Moses, and Tanya Schling. And the other names are listed in your bulletin. In holy baptism, our Lord Jesus Christ liberated you from sin and death and made you members of his church. Through word and sacrament, you have been nurtured in faith. I ask you, together with all who are gathered here, to confess the faith of the church, the faith in which we are baptized. Invite the congregation to stand. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The congregation may be seated. St. Paul writes, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit gives them. There are different ways of serving, but the same Lord is served. There are different abilities to perform service, but the same God gives to everyone ability for particular service. The Spirit's presence is shown in some way in each person for the good of all. You have been elected to positions of leadership and trust in this congregation. You are to see that the words and deeds of this household of faith reflect him in whose name we gather. You are to work together with other members to see that the worship and work of Christ are done in this congregation and that God's will is done in this community and in the whole world. You are to be diligent in your specific area of serving that the one Lord who empowers you is glorified. You are to be examples of faith active in love to help maintain the life and harmony of this congregation. On behalf of your sisters and brothers in Christ, I ask you, are you ready to accept and faithfully to carry out the duties of the offices to which you have been elected? If so, respond with the words, yes, by the help of God. Invite the congregation to stand. People of God, I ask you, will you support these, your elected leaders, and will you share in the mutual ministry that Christ has given to all who are baptized? Yes, by the help of God. I now declare you as installed as council members of Grace Lutheran Church. God bless you with the whole, his Holy Spirit, that you may prove faithful servants of Christ. Amen. Amen. Council members may remain up here as we continue our worship with the prayers of intercession. United in Christ and guided by the Spirit, we pray for the church, the creation, and all in need. As the generations rise and fall before you, Heavenly Father, you provide persons of faith to continue your holy work on earth. We ask to be included among the faithful, that in our time others will come to know your name and serve you above all else. God of grace, hear our prayer. prayer. Give us a vision of the future, Holy Spirit, that we may sing like the psalmist in confidence of a bright future with you in the world to come. God of grace, hear Hear our our prayer. prayer. Holy Spirit, let us live by your spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control above all other goals. God of grace, hear Hear our our prayer. prayer. Great physician, you know our infirmities before we even name a name. 
yet we are bold to call upon you for those in need. Today we pray for Diane, Richard, Ron, Joanne, Jan, and those whom we name in our hearts before you. God of grace, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, give us the will to be your faithful servants and the help of the Holy Spirit for the courage on the journey. We give thanks for all who have died and now celebrate the inheritance of life in you. Keep their examples of faithfulness always before us so that we trust your promises in life and in death. God of grace, hear our prayer. Lord, we give you thanks for these newly installed members of the Grace Congregation Council. Give to them wisdom, courage, and strength to fulfill the important work of tending this community of faith. Help each of us to support them with our love, help, and prayers. God of grace, hear our prayer. prayer. Into your hands, O God of compassion, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your great mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. I invite you to share a greeting of peace with those around you. Let us pray. God of abundance, you have set before us a plentiful harvest. As we feast on your goodness, strengthen us to labor in your field and equip us to bear fruit for the good of all. In the name of Jesus. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love, you have sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, 
who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, for supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. But remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In Christ's presence there is fullness of joy. Come to the banquet. You may be seated. If any are receiving the elements, the prepared elements in the pews, you can make them ready at this time. And when they are ready, take and eat the body of Christ and take and drink the blood of Christ.
And now may the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and his holy and precious blood strengthen and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Life-giving God, through this meal you have bandaged our wounds and fed us with your mercy. Now send us forth to live for others, both friend and stranger, that all may come to know your love. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. The God of peace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you, comfort you, and show you the path of life this day and always. Amen. We sing this. Love your neighbor. Thanks be to God.